Okay, now we're finally going to do MOSFETs. This is uh, probably the most important semiconductor device if you look at uh, modern electronics. And, you know, this is some great images to start today. Um, you've got the first commercial integrated circuit based on MOSFETs from 1964. Um, this is the Intel 4004, 4-bit processor, a little over 2,000 transistors, a blazing speed of 92 kilohertz, and if you wanted it back then, it would cost you about $60,000. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how far we've come. And so you take this, you package it, and that was what you bought back then for $60,000. And then you look at a modern chip here, and you can obviously see the, uh, the density of features has gone up substantially. Anytime you see these colors like this, that means the wires are getting so close together they're within you know the order of a wavelength of light and that basically causes optical diffraction so you get this this these all these colors the same way you get when you have a thin very thin film of oil on water you get that rainbow effect same thing here really small features so when you see color on a circuit like this that tells you that it's diffracting light and that the features are entirely very small uh, the interesting thing about MOSFETs is that no other human artifact has been fabricated in larger numbers than MOSFETs. And MOSFETs are pretty recent. I mean, we're talking only several decades of fabrication. So that means not more nails, not more spearheads, you know, cups, bowls, nothing uh, is even close to MOSFETs. So it's the number one artifact of all time that we've created as humans. So, let's do a MOSFET. And you know what? Again, if you know PN junctions, you pretty much need, know everything you need to know, okay? And so let's see if we can figure this out. So let's look at this figure here, and I'll explain what a, how a MOSFET is, uh, is made here and what are the main features here. So the first thing you have to see here is that I've got a lightly doped P-type substrate. So this is my substrate, and it's lightly doped P-type. And you'll notice here that I've got this region of N-type semiconductor. It's N+, plus and it's the source and the drain. So here's my source and drain. Okay, and I'll make my contacts through the source and drain here and here. So this is where I make my metal contacts. Okay. The next thing you'll note is that I've got this thermal oxide here. This is silicon dioxide. Remember, it's a wide band gap, so it is electrically insulating. And so I have that oxide all the way across here, and that's why I cut these holes here and here, so I can make metal contact down to the source and drain. But importantly, notice here, Right in this region here, I've got oxide, and on top of that, I've got a gate. The gate is a highly doped semiconductor, so it's acting like a metal. So if you look at this, I've got a metal oxide semiconductor, hence the term MOS, and of course it's a transistor that's field effect, MOSFET. Okay? And again, here I've got this thicker oxide. The only purpose of this is to oscillate isolate one MOSFET from another one over here, from another one over here, okay? So anyway, let's look underneath this thing and let's try to understand how this thing works. And so let's look at a cross-section from here across here. So let's say I wanted to get current to flow, electrons to flow from the source to drain. Remember the electrons are the source, the source is the source of electrons, so flow in this direction. What would the band diagram look like? Well, I have N plus material, lightly doped P material, and N plus material. If I look at the band diagram, here's my N plus material, here's my lightly doped P-type material, and here's N plus material here, okay? And by the way, if you're wondering what these circle things are, they're actually showing here in the band diagram where the dopant atoms are. So these would be phosphorus atoms that have ionized and created electrons, and these would be boron atoms here, which have stolen electron and created holes. So this is your first introduction to seeing how you would put those in a band diagram. And it kind of makes sense that the phosphorus atoms would be closer to the conduction band, hence their ability to give up an electron to the conduction band. But anyway, don't worry about that. Mainly focus on the electrons here and the holes here and the electrons here. So, I have a transistor. I want to get current flow from source to drain. Looking at this diagram here and looking at this band diagram here, tell me right away why I can't get current flow from the source to the drain. Well, think PN junctions. I've got NP and PN. No matter what I do here, just like a BJT, if I put voltage 
on either side across this, one of the diodes would become reverse biased. Again, I've got two facing e two diodes facing each other. And so if I put voltage across here, one of the diodes will always be reverse biased. And so I will get almost no current flow because you know that reverse saturation current is extremely low. Okay? So then you say, okay, well, how do I get this transistor to turn on? Because right now I'm looking at it, it's off. And it, it makes sense in the band diagram, too. I want electrons to go across here, but I've got this barrier. So let's apply some voltage to the gate. What kind of voltage would you apply to the gate, you think, to, uh, to alter this situation? Well, if you look at this, I'd like to apply positive voltage to the gate. And remember, positive voltage, what's that do to my bands? It shifts my bands down. So if I shift this down, I could remove this barrier here such that electrons could drift across here in electric field. So to turn this MOSFET off, I apply a positive voltage to the gate, shifts the bands down, and electrons drift across. Now be careful. The operation is actually a little bit more complicated than that. We'll cover that in lecture today, but this is your first order principle and principles in terms of understanding how this device works. Here's a drain current versus uh, drain voltage plot versus several gate voltages. You can see you put a little bit of positive voltage, start to shift this down a little bit, positive voltage, shift it down. You get a little bit of current as you increase drain voltage. You get more and more positive voltage. You're going to basically reduce the barrier for electron flow more and more and get more current flow. And notice that the current saturates. We'll get to that too. Just like JFETs and uh, BJTs, we end up running into this sort of saturation current type effect. Okay. Last thing I'll note is that let's say we tried to do this the other way with voltage. We put negative voltage on the gate. What would happen? Well, negative voltage is just going to raise this up, right? And you're going to have a bigger barrier so you won't get current flow. And so only positive voltage will turn this device on. Now again, this is oversimplified. You're going to see it's a little bit more complex in terms of what's required to get electrons to flow from left to right. So this slide summarizing summarizing what we said before. At, uh, at equilibrium, my Fermi levels all line up. I end up with a barrier, so I get back-to-back PN junctions. I apply a positive voltage, pushes the bands down. I get a conductive channel of electrons across here, and then I got current flow. Now there are two types of MOSFETs. The device at left is an enhancement mode N-channel device. Okay? It's called N-channel because I want electrons to get through the channel. So I need this to be effectively N-type across here, hence N-channel to turn it on. Enhancement mode is normally off, meaning you don't apply voltage, you get no current flow. So this is an enhancement mode device. We will focus in this course mainly on enhancement mode. Depletion mode is the opposite. It's normally on. So a depletion mode device would maybe have no barrier here, and instead you would apply maybe a negative voltage to shift the bands up to create the barrier and block the current flow. So you could see that you could have this thing be normally on or normally off, but we will focus on the normally off enhancement mode. Again, here's our device here. Let's look at it in terms of uh, the colors and, and diagrams we typically see. This device here is unbiased. It's floating. There's no voltage applied. Notice I get a depletion region here between my N-type semiconductor and P-type. Okay. Notice also that this is heavily doped N+. Why is that? Well, there's two reasons. One, if I want to have a lot of current flow through here, then I should at minimum make sure that these contacts here are heavily doped as well, so like they can support the current flow. Furthermore, the way I create these things is that I put a, I, I diffuse in a dopant level that is greater than the background level. So if I have the background is basically a bunch of boron atoms, which makes p-type silicon, then I want to diffuse in even more phosphorus atoms here and here to create n-type material, and I typically need it to be higher doped so it overcomes the previous p-type doping. Okay. The other reasons why it's nice to have N plus is that if I put voltages here and that increases the reverse bias on this, which is, we'll see is important, it won't deplete into here and then start to basically reduce my conductive uh, volume of this, uh, of this contact. So again, if I put voltage across here with no gate here, I'd have PN junction, PN junction, and one of them would block my current flow because one of them would be reverse biased. 
the only option we have to get conduction here is to basically make this n-type. So we're going to focus most of our attention on figuring out how do we basically switch this from being p-type to n-type material. And so it's more complicated than just reducing that barrier. We actually have to basically switch this into n-type material sum here electrically so we no longer have p-n junctions on either side. Okay? What would happen if we reversed all the doping types? That's easy. We'll do that later, but you'll see that basically all my voltages and currents required reverse. So instead of playing, applying a positive voltage here to turn this on, I would have to apply a negative voltage instead to turn it on. Okay? If you can already answer these questions, then you're pretty well on your way to understand basic MOSFET principles. Okay, so again, here's the basic operation. We put positive voltage on the gate, and I essentially switch this into n-type material. This kind of makes sense, too. You know, if I'm putting positive voltage on the gate, that's positive charge, right? So I'm putting a bunch of positive charges on this side. Well, if I have positive charges on one side of a capacitor, because here's my oxide, right? Then you know the other side of the cop capacitor has to have the opposite charge, which is electrons. So that's another way to remember how this thing turns on or off, is just by charges on either side of a capacitor. Okay. In this case, I put a drain voltage. I've got a small source to drain current. Okay, so I get my current flow through this device. This electron accumulation here, it's called inversion. Okay, and it's called inversion because I'm inverting the material from p-type and now tricking it into thinking it's n-type. So I've inverted the type of material, and once I have inversion, then I can get current flow through this device. Again. This electron accumulation or inversion mimics n-type material, and that's why this device is called an NMOS device, meaning that it is an n-type channel. If I had a PMOS device, I would have an n-type silicon substrate here, and instead I would have p-type here, p-type here, and I would try to make a p-type channel to connect the p-type regions, and it would be called PMOS. Also, because I've made this an n-type channel, and this is p-type here, it makes a junction, right? It makes a diode. So you can see that the depletion region has also been drawn here because I've tricked this into n-type material, this is p-type, and so of course I should have a depletion region between n-type and p-type material. This is also good because this depletion region isolates this transistor from the substrate. That's really important because when we show you how to make inverters and logic circuits, you can't have the currents of one transistor leaking into the substrate and then going way over here to another transistor and screwing it up. You need it to be isolated, and you'll see these depletion regions work elegantly at isolating one transistor from another so that their logic doesn't screw each other up. Now, you'll see something familiar here now. If I basically keep incre increasing my drain voltage, look what happens here. You get something just like JFETs and MESFETs. We get this pinch-off effect. Why'd that happen? Well, look at this, okay? I applied positive voltage to basically build up these electrons, right? Well, if I put positive voltage on this gate right here, my positive voltage is counteracting this positive voltage. Remember, if I want to have charge built up across a capacitor, I have to have voltage built up across the capacitor. Well, if I have positive voltage here and positive voltage here, and the voltages are about the same, I have no net voltage drop and therefore no charge build up across a capacitor. You can't charge a capacitor without voltage across it, right? I go further over to this side, I've got zero volts, right? And then I have my nice positive voltage drop, so I get maximum um, charge accumulation. And in between, this is a resistor, right? And so as current flows across here, I get a resistor. And so I get a voltage drop from the maximum positive to zero, and hence why my channel increases in accumulated charge as I go across there. And you get that exact same pinch-off effect we had for JFETs and, MES and MESFETs, where we said that, well, okay, if I put too much positive voltage, the depletion region should disappear, but if it dis I mean, it should, it should cut this off, but if I cut off the current flow, then my zero voltage here would come all the way back through here because there'd be no current flow and no voltage drop. Well, then that opens this back up again. As soon as this opens back up, then you could say, okay, the voltage gets back in there from this side and it pinches it off again. So you get this balance of those two 
and you have the opportunity also for some tunneling. So this all balances off just like it did for a uh, for a, uh, uh, JFET as well. Um, there's a great animation of this. I encourage you to go to this website and it'll let you put a little uh, some voltages on it. It'll show the current flows, the pinch off, the depletion regions growing, and show you how these devices work. So go to the simulation and try it. Okay, let's bring it all together and we'll do some review. Okay, no voltage is applied here. I apply a positive voltage to the gate to create my end type channel. I get current flow. So there's my end type channel formed and I get current flow. I increase VD even more and I eventually get to pinch off. Here's my curves here, drain current versus drain voltage. For a given gate voltage, more gate voltage, I get more electrons here, hence more conductivity and more current flow. So more gate voltage gives me more current flow out the drain. And you can see in these curves here that when I start off at small drain voltages, I get a linear response, right? Because then this is acting like a resistor. So more voltage across the resistor, more current. But eventually you start to get this pinch off to occur, like we see here. And you hit saturation, just like we did for other types of transistors. Okay? Now, we are not going to spend a lot of time on drain current as a function of drain voltage. Or even drain current as a function of gate voltage. All we really care about for most applications is threshold voltage. At what point can you turn this on? So why is that? Well, think about the applications. The single biggest application for this device is a logic device. Is it on or off? A zero or a one? So we're going to focus a lot of our attention for this device on threshold voltage. Unlike BJTs where we spent a lot of time figuring out where the currents were, right? So to do this, to figure out threshold voltage, we need to answer how inversion creates electrons in a p-type material. And remember, we have no current injection, it's just a capacitor. So we know that the Fermi level is going to have to shift and do something to change the material from p-type to n-type because Fermi level predicts whether material is p-type or n-type. So let's derive the threshold voltage hang in there, but you'll see it come together nicely at the end. So, let's look at our metal oxide semiconductor capacitor. I just want to look at the portion of the device which has the metal on top of the oxide on top of the semiconductor where we want to create the channel. Let's not look at the source and drain for now. Just look at that MOS part of this device. Okay? So, here's my metal. Here is my semiconductor. It's P-type, right? Fermi level closer to the valence band. And for simplicity at this point, let's just assume that my metal work function and semiconductor work function, let's assume they're equal, so the Fermi levels line up, okay? Now for convenience in this course, when we do MOSFETs, when we introduce the oxide, we're not going to talk about work functions all the way to the vacuum level, we're just going to compare them to the conduction band of the oxide, and so we'll use a lowercase phi sub m and phi sub s. So we'll, instead of referencing it to the vacuum level, we will reference these to the conduction band of the oxide, which is up here. So here's my metal, here's the oxide, so my gate, oxide, here's where I want to make my channel from p-type to n-type. Okay? Quick question. I said the oxide has a conduction band, then how is it insulating, right? Because if it has a conduction band, shouldn't it conduct? Well, remember, it can have a conduction band. The point is, is that the band gap energy of silicon to oxide is huge compared to silicon. And so the amount of energy required to thermally generate an electron down in the valence band, way up here to the conduction band, is huge. And so you don't see any electrons at room temperature make it from here to here. So it is insulating, just because the band gap is so wide. Okay? So we join our, our metal at the gate, our oxide underneath the gate, and here's where I want to make my channel underneath it. And the next thing I want to do is pull it all together here. And I'm going to add one more term here, phi sub f here. This term phi sub f is basically how, long, how far below the intrinsic Fermi level for undoped silicon is my actual Fermi level for the semiconductor. This is an energy band diagram, so I multiply charge times potential, and that gives me energy to tell me how far a level down below the intrinsic level the Fermi level has shifted. 
I also labeled the band gap energies, the oxides around 9 electron volts, silicon around 1.1. Again, that's why this is insulating because it has a really wide band gap. Okay, so let's put some voltage on this and try to get this thing to work. So remember, our goal here is to get conductivity between the metal, the oxide, and here, get, get conductivity between the drain and the source. So we need to get charges here to get current flow from source to drain or drain to source. So here I am at equilibrium. I've applied no voltage, and of course if I apply no voltage for this, I should get no band bending and everything should line up like it began when, to start with. Okay. Let's do something first. The first thing I want to do is I want to apply a negative voltage to the gate. So let's apply a negative voltage to the gate. So if I apply a negative voltage, here's my gate metal. Which way does that shift our band? Remember, negative repels electrons. So if it's a tarp of water, it shifts it up, right? And so my band shift up. And again, I have a dielectric here, right, with a voltage drop across it. As I put voltage here, I have a voltage drop across this, so it has to have band bending as well. Anytime my conduction and valence bands have bending in them, that, apply, that implies electric field. Furthermore, looking at this, you could tell my slope's constant, so that means my electric field is constant. And that makes sense. Anytime you have a dielectric, if I put voltage across it, the electric field across the dielectric is constant, hence why I'm drawing my slope here with a straight line. So this shifts up. It brings this end of the oxide up, and also it starts to drag the semiconductor up on this side. Look what happens here. Well, I start to accumulate positive charges. Okay, That makes sense because for two reasons. It makes sense for, for one reason it makes sense because if I have a bunch of holes here, then they're, gonna, they're the bubbles. They're floating up. Well, then of course they're going to float to the highest point here. So they'll start to accumulate here. So I'll get more holes under the surface. It also makes sense because if I put negative charge on one side of a capacitor, then I better see positive charge of equal magnitude show up on the other side of the capacitor. And the capacitor just is, is polarizable internally, so it has this sort of charge redirection inside. We'll talk more about that later when we look at uh, MOSFETs in, in greater detail, and I'll review how dielectrics basically propagate charge through them without having net current flow. So what's wrong with this? Why does this not help us? I said, if I, you know, why can't I get current flow across here? I mean, if I, I'm saying I'm creating more and more charge here. Wouldn't that be great and help me get more conductivity to get more current from source to drain? Why not? Well, these are holes, right? And so I still get back-to-back PN junctions. In fact, I've made things worse. I've made this heavily doped P-type now instead of lightly doped by accumulating more holes and that reduces my reverse saturation current even further between one of these diodes, which will be reverse bias as I apply voltage from here to here. And so I've done nothing to try to enable current flow through this. So, okay, that's the wrong way to do this. Don't apply negative voltage to the gate. That doesn't work. So what can I do instead? Well, let's obviously then put positive voltage on the gate. We said that would turn this on. So I'm going to put positive voltage here. And let's look what happens here. Well, the first thing that we're going to see that happens here is I apply positive voltage, shifts the bands down, right? Positive voltage shifts it down, pulls this side of the oxide down. I get my electric field dropped across the oxide here and also starts to pull the semiconductor down, bands down too. But wait a second. I said that if I put positive voltage here, I would see a ton of electrons here, and I'm not drawing any. Why not? Why, you know, why am I not saying that this all of a sudden turns this device on? Well, there's two things that have happened here. First off, I had a bunch of holes all across here, right? Holes that are now here are going to float in this direction because of the electric field, right? So they're going to float out this way, and they will be depleted. So I have now depleted this region of holes because they float up, and they float over here. So I have holes here, but none here because I've now depleted it, okay? The second thing that I look at is, well, what about electrons up here? Well, you know, sure, electrons can float from here to here, but just like a reverse bias diode, if this is the p-type, if this is p-type material, how many electrons are up here? There's almost none, right? This, there are very few electrons because this is p-type material. 
And so even though I create this little area where electrons could drift from here to here and start to accumulate here, I'm not going to see any current flow practically because there are so few electrons here, it doesn't matter if they go in this direction. They can't build up to the right concentration anyway. The other thing that's interesting about this is that, again, we have this idea of, of preserving charge across the dielectric. If I apply, let's draw this up, I'm applying a, a positive voltage here, right? I put positive voltage, and I've got positive charge on this side, right? Well, that means I must have negative charge over here on the, on the semiconductor side, right, across my uh, capacitor. Where's my negative charge? Well, my negative charge is going to show up on this side in terms of the boron atoms that created holes. So I have these negatively charged boron atoms that when I basically sweep away the holes, I leave behind the boron atoms with their negative charge, and that gives me the negative charge, which counteracts the positive charge on the other side. So this is depletion charge showing up here. I have not yet created the type of negative charge I want, which would be here, electrons which could flow. Okay? So, let's keep moving on and let's try to drive threshold voltage because clearly we're not yet there in terms of getting to our threshold voltage to get current flow. Okay. So, I said we put a little bit of positive voltage here, we get depletion. So, we deplete out the holes. What we need is inversion we apply more voltage and then at some point I will start to see electrons accumulate here. When I see the electrons accumulate here then I can get conduction from the source to drain. So if this is my, let me draw my MOSFET here, here's my uh, source and drain, here's my my gate here, sorry I didn't draw that really well, I should have kept that on then, I'll make my, I'll make my um, make my oxide black here so it looks like one thing there so there's my here's my MOSFET okay and there's my gate here's my source here's my drain in this diagram here I'm looking at current flow in this direction which here is into the plane okay and so if I can get electrons to show up here I'll have n type n type n type current flow across here is into the plane here so I'm looking into the plane under the oxide okay well, to get this inversion, this is going to make sense, okay? And so what, look what's happening here. Here was my intrinsic Fermi level for untyped, undoped material, and here's my Fermi level for the p-type material as it actually is. When I applied more positive voltage here, I dragged all of this down enough. So look what's happening now. Now that I've bent this down enough that if I mapped out my original Fermi level here, across here, it's now above the intrinsic level. You see that right there? It's now above the intrinsic level. Remember, as soon as my Fermi level shifts above the intrinsic level, that means it's becoming n-type material. So here at the interface, you can see I bent this down enough that it starts to think that it's n-type material. Same kind of shifting we had when we went the Fermi level closer you know, we have density of states, Fermi distribution, shift it closer to the conduction band, you get more overlap of this curve with this, and you start to get more and more carriers showing up. And you can see that here. I bent this down far enough that it shifted it on an energy band diagram enough that it starts to think that its Fermi level is really close to the conduction band and now above the intrinsic level, meaning it's becoming n-type material. However, that's not enough. If we want to get this device to turn on, we need true n-type conducting material. We want it to be n plus. We want strong inversion. Not just the beginning inversion. We want strong inversion. So to achieve this, the surface has to be just as n-type as it was originally p-type. So if I was this far down here, I need the shifting here to shift it up just as far above the intrinsic level. If I do that, then I will have strong inversion. You'll see why I need to shift it by two phi sub f in a moment. Okay? And so you can see in this diagram here, I've achieved strong inversion, lots of electrons, because I was originally this far below it. And at the band interface here, where I bend the band, so here's my oxide, and this is going into the semiconductor, you can see that it's now 
even at least phi sub f or more than phi sub f above the intrinsic level, okay? And we'll map this at the surface. We'll call this surface potential. So the total amount of band bending. So if I, no band bending here, and if I go all the way down to here, right, the difference between this and here, I can map also between this and here, right, the Fermi level bending, that's surface potential. The reason why we call it surface potential is this is an energy band diagram, right? And so I multiply the total potential at the surface times Q, and that gives me energy on an energy band diagram. So that's why I call it surface potential, and if I multiply it by Q, I can then plot it as band bending on an energy diagram, energy band diagram as well. So, again, another way to put this is that to get strong inversion, we need the surface potential to be twice the Fermi level offset. So we need the total band bending here at the surface, okay, how much this is pulled down here, to be twice the Fermi level offset. So, at inversion, when I get a conducting channel where I get enough electrons to get current flow and electrons moving from the source to drain through this circuit, I want to have the surface potential be greater than 2 phi sub f. And fortunately, phi sub f is really easy to calculate. When we did, first did band diagrams and we looked at the offset from the intrinsic level, you have this simple equation here where phi sub f is kT over q times the natural log of the p-type doping over ni. If you increase the p-type doping more and more, this goes up and phi sub f goes up, meaning that it's becoming more p-type, shifts close to the valence band. Units make sense too. What's kT over Q? That's thermal voltage, right? And this is unitless, and so I end up with units of volts. And if I multiply phi sub f times Q, then I get electron volts and I can put it on the band diagram. Again, in a moment we will see why we need 2 phi sub f, okay? And this is kind of cool, too, because this is called surface potential. So that's good. Potential is a voltage, right? So this is going to come right into when we calculate threshold voltage, we're already building up a term which we're going to add into threshold voltage, right? So this is already starting to make sense. So let's figure out the rate at which these electrons start to appear in this channel using some things we already know, okay? So way out here in the bulk material, we know that we can calculate the n-type concentration as the intrinsic carrier concentration times the, first, the, the change in the Fermi levels for the Fermi distribution here. So if this is my E sub f, okay, here's E sub f, and here's E sub i, the intrinsic level. And so in this case over here, okay, E sub i is greater than E sub f. So this becomes negative negative times ni means that this becomes smaller and n naught is even lower than the thermally generated intrinsic carrier concentration. That makes sense because this is p-type material. Well we can get rid of this stuff here and we'll just call that phi sub f because e sub, e sub, e sub f minus e sub i, okay, I mean sorry, phi sub e sub f, the Fermi level, minus the intrinsic level, okay, is just phi sub f. So that's just phi sub f. So I'll just put that in there. And again, because this is greater than that, I get a negative symbol out there, and you can see that if phi sub f gets larger, meaning that this shifts closer to the valence band, this is a negative exponential. That means that my electron concentration goes down. That should make sense, because if I have more and more holes here, they're going to recombine even faster with electrons here and kill off my starting concentration, n sub i, of the thermally generated electron concentration. So... We don't care about things out here. We care about the potential as we shift in this direction towards the channel right under the gate oxide. So again, this is here's my oxide here. I'm looking into the semiconductor. I'm looking in this direction right under the oxide. Okay? So let's look at this a little bit more closely here. You'll notice that I get my electrons accumulating here. And then I have no electrons here, which is some depletion region. Look what I have here. I've got electrons accumulating, and a little bit further away, I've got some depletion region, and then I get p-type material out here again. So that makes sense. The other thing I want to do next, then, is come back to this equation, and I'm going to introduce a new term, just phi, meaning how much band bending do I have as I move 
from x to x equals 0, moving in this direction. So as a function of x, how much band bending do I have? And so what I'll do then is I will introduce this into the same equation up here. I have phi sub f minus phi. Okay? So I put phi sub f minus phi, and eventually you can see that phi becomes the surface potential, right? So if I put that in there, I put that in there, you can see I could break these exponentials out, and I'll end up with ni e to the e to the q phi sub f over kt, e to the q sub phi over kt. I just broke these out into two exponentials. And I'll recognize that here, this is just this, right? So I could take this whole term here and recognize that that's just n naught. So I'll put n naught for there, and I end up with the following equation. This should make sense too. Look at this. What I'm saying here is that my n-type concentration, as I move in this direction here, right, goes up as phi increases. That should make sense because we said as I get more band bending and phi increases, it's small, it gets larger, 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 it reaches its maximum, phi's increasing, I'm getting more band bending and I will see more electrons show up. This shows that the rate at which that occurs is exponential with phi. So my n-type concentration at any position x here increases exponentially with phi. And that should, again, make sense because it's dependent on the Fermi distribution. And I could do the same thing for holes. For holes, it'll be opposite, right? If you're creating electrons, then you're killing holes. And for holes, I'm looking at the, the band shifting in the other direction. So as I go in this direction here, and, and phi's increasing, number of holes is disappearing as well. And that makes sense because further out here, more of the holes are going to disappear as well because they're drifting out this way because of the electric field. So maybe you've got a couple here that had enough energy to kind of uh, diffuse over here briefly, but over here you're going to have almost none. And that shows that because it exponentially decreases as phi is getting bigger and bigger, the hole concentration goes down as I move in this direction. So, so what's this tell you about the, uh, this device here? You should be able to already see this has profound impact on this device in terms of the, uh, the, the current flow as a function of uh, gate voltage. Well, again, if I'm applying voltage, which is potential out here, and that gives me a potential or voltage appearing at the surface, and the rate at which electrons are created here is exponentially dependent on the amount of band bending or surface potential which we have shown here right then that tells me that the amount of electrons created in the channel will increase exponentially with positive gate voltage so now I have a great way to understand based off on simple principles we already understood that if I apply voltage to this the rate at which my electrons appear in this channel is exponential with gate voltage. And so this is a great logic device because you'll go above a certain voltage and then you go a little bit more and all of a sudden you get a ton of current which means it goes straight from a zero to a one state in terms of a logic circuit. So it's got a very fast threshold. It doesn't gradually build up, it builds up charge exponentially once you go above the threshold voltage. Very important if you want to make a logic device out of this transistor. So Let's start to try to build this up a little bit uh, deeper, and, and we'll, then that'll tell us why we need two phi sub f, so you'll see that in a second here. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply Poisson's equation to try to figure out the electric field right here at the interface here. So how much, if I have an, you know, if, again, anytime you have a, um, a system like this where I've got voltage applied across metal, oxide, and semiconductor, you can see I've got electric field, right? Because the bands are bending. So I've got electric field. How, what's the electric field right here at the surface? So we're going to try to figure that out. And so we use Poisson's equation, which was really simple. It says that if I want to have a change in volt, a change in, let me write this down here, actually. If I have this, what's this? Change in voltage over distance. Well, that is E field, right? And so if I look at this here, this is change in E field over distance. This is the, like the second derivative of change in voltage. All Poisson's equation says is it's a second order differential equation that helps us predict these type of systems because it says that my 
change in not potential, but the second derivative, so it's this change in E field with respect to distance, is dependent on the amount of charge I have. Well, that's easy. If I want to have a large change in E field with over distance, then I better have a lot of charges to, to achieve that. So my charge density is all the charges I have. If you have no charges or very few charges, then how could you have a large change in E field over distance, right? And so that's all the Poisson's equation is saying. And of course, when you have E field, it's, that also is determined partly by dielectric constant because that relates voltage into, um, in, into uh, I mean, charge into capacitance. So we'll take Poisson's equation and we'll basically, you know, use what I had right here, that electric field is change in potential versus distance. And with, if the distance and plot, the polarities I have here, it's minus dV dx, or in this case, d phi. It can be shown that, and I'm not going to derive it, that the E field perpendicular to the surface, meaning coming out in this direction, okay, that the E field can be calculated as follows. Now, looking at this, this electric field at the surface, perpendicular to the surface, LD is to bio length. It comes up a lot in electrostatics. And so I'll explain to bio length very quickly. So if I, let's say I have some kind of, um, any kind of system here, and I've got a dielectric, and I want to attract, uh, let's just say, a ton of electrons right to the surface. Well, you know that I could have put a voltage across here to attract those electrons, right? So I put positive charges on this side, if I could actually draw some positive charges correctly here. But let me ask you this. Could I get an infinitely thin layer of electrons on this side? What would prevent that from happening? Well, remember that anytime you build up a high concentration of something, diffusion wants to push them in the other direction, right? And so this Debye length basically accounts for the fact that as you put positive charges on this side of a system, and I've got some insulator in between, the negative charges are not going to all collapse right at the interface. In fact, you'll get a lot at the interface, but some will be a little bit further out just because they're getting pushed out by diffusion from high concentration to low. That makes sense too. Look what's in here, temperature. If temperature goes up, then your Debye length or the amount of the, like the, it's, it's like the effective thickness of this charge layer increases because you have more diffusion pushing these charges further out and away. So I thought I'd introduce to bi length because you'll see it come up a lot in electrostatics and it's showing up in this equation here. Um, the other thing you'll see here is if I go to really heavy doping, if I increase p naught, my Debye length goes down. Well, that's because if I, ha I have more charges basically to counteract. So if I look at my electric field here, if you have more charges out here, then and in this case, the negative charges would be um, also the, uh, the phosphorus atoms. If you have more charges out here, then that kind of counteracts building up a high concentration here, and you have less of a, you have less of a uh, concentration gradient. So that could reduce the Debye length. Anyway, let's get back to the main thing, this electric field. So, I could take this electric field, and then I can get the <clears throat> amount of charge <coughs> right here at the surface, Q sub, Q sub surf, okay, surface, which is what I want, right? How much charge do I have here at the interface? That'll tell me how conductive this is going to be. And so I can apply Gauss's law at the surface, which is basically takes dielectric constant in a material times the electric field at the surface and that tells you the charge at the surface. So I get charge density in terms of coulombs per centimeter squared. Okay? And note that this is at the surface right right here at x equals zero. So I have this great equation, I'll shift in the charge and I have this plot of charge versus surface potential and at this point you're like what does this mean? It looks like a complete mess. Hang in there. We're going to take a break, and then I'm going to explain this chart, and it will make complete sense, and it will, reveal every, it will reveal everything you need to know about the MOSFET and its threshold voltage. So again, this is a chart plot of the charge right under the gate oxide, right here at the interface, as a function of the amount of surface potential going from, from bias in this direction to bias in the other direction. So the key to understanding this plot and capacitance versus voltage for a MOSFET and charge distribution versus voltage, which is important, and threshold voltage 
is that we must understand that there are a series of events that take place in biasing a MOSFET. You have accumulation, <coughs> flat band, depletion, and inversion. And if you want to go from accumulation to inversion, or from depletion to accumulation or flat band to inversion, you have to go through each of these sequentially. You can't get from one to the other with, by, without skipping in the other states. Okay? And so we had showed these, and that's what we're going to show you next. But at this point, let's do some review, and we'll take a break. So here's some quick review. Here's my MOSFET. Why can't I get current flow as you see it here from drain to source, or source to drain, depending on how I put the voltages? That should be pretty easy. Okay? If I apply negative voltage to the gate, what will happen? Well, you'll see I get no current across the channel. Why is that? You've got a great hint here. If I apply positive voltage, not negative, positive voltage to the gate, what will happen first before I can get current flow across this, before the MOSFET turns on? If I have this thing on, let's say I put positive voltage here, the MOSFET's on, I get this on, I get my conductive channel, but I keep putting more and more drain voltage here, what will happen? Well, that's easy to answer. You should be able to see it in your mind at this point and answer it using the same terms we used for previous trans <coughs> transistors. Last, last point, this is called NMOS. Well, this is on a P-type substrate. Why do we call it NMOS? No hint needed. You should know that at this point. 